Asbestos is a known carcinogen, and there's no safe level of exposure. Mesothelioma is a miserable disease. They must fight a truly global battle. We want to demonstrate our enormous respect. Keep up the good work. I look forward to the day when ADAO is no longer needed. Fix it. Fix it. Everything in the world can be fixed. Keep me in your heart for a while. So you see about training and abatement and professionals. Now we're going to bring a strong sense of the human side. We'll begin with uh, Joe Shufro, who's been doing this public health work for uh, over 30 years. And it's not just the worker that Joel works to protect. It's also the family. So welcome, Joel Shufro, please. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, it's been a little over 10 years since the attack on the World Trade Center, and Linda asked me to speak about NICOSH's perspective on what we have learned and what we have not learned about worker and community protection. As you know, our organization, NICOSH, uh, was very involved in the, in the uh, aftermath of the attack on the World Trade Center. We were one of the first organizations to put out literature about the types of hazards that workers were, uh, the types of hazards workers would face after the World Trade Center, which included asbestos, but many, many other, uh, other chemicals. We were called hysterical by uh, many government agencies, and I think, uh, uh, in retrospect, we weren't hysterical enough about what problems people were going to face. Uh, so the question is, if we were to suffer a similar event, today, would we be better prepared? And in some areas, I think we have learned a lot. In others, I fear we are heading in the wrong direction. Tens of thousands of residents, area workers, visitors, students, uh, were exposed to the, the toxic materials that blanketed lower Manhattan after 9-11. Uh, estimated that 40,000 to 90,000 people alone were on the pile uh, in the time after 9-11. 300,000 people lived downtown uh, in, in the area that the cloud covered. Many thousands of workers and volunteers were involved in the rescue effort. Others arrived later. They were exposed to a wide range of contaminants, including carcinogens, including tons of asbestos, and non-carcinogens. Many of these workers and volunteers who engaged in rescue, recovery, and cleanup work, as well as those who worked in lower Manhattan, area residents, students, and volunteers, have developed a wide range of diseases as a result of exposure to the dust. While some of those who were ill are no longer symptomatic, many are. Some whose symptoms went into remission have become symptomatic again. We know that there are increasing numbers of uh, reports of cancer among the uh, exposed population. And until several months ago, approximately 200 workers were reporting the onset of new symptoms each month. And this is 10 years after 9-11. The attack on the World Trade Center provides us with an opportunity to look at how effectively institutions which regulate worker safety and health function as uh, as, as ways in which the gov and in ways in which the government responds to an environmental crisis, how efficiently and effectively our system of providing medical care works, and how our system of providing compensation to those who were injured at work or to those who lived in the neighborhoods of Lower Manhattan function. It is, I think, in a crisis such as what we witnessed at the World Trade Center, that everyday problems faced by those administering the system as well as those who depend upon the system for protection are clearly illuminated. The first thing I think that needs to be noted is that it was precisely those segments of our society who have been subjected to the most savage attacks by the Republican Party leadership, uh, as well as some Democrats, including our own governor of the state of New York, upon, uh, upon whom we depended in the days and months after the attack of the World Trade Center. Public sector workers, unionized workers, and immigrant workers, many of whom were undocumented. The role of public sector workers was critical to the rescue and recovery work. 
Not only were New York City firefighters and police involved, but thousands of transit workers, sanitation workers, traffic officers, civil engineers, members of the New York City Health and Environmental Protection Agencies volunteered and were assigned to engage in rescue recovery and cleanup work. Unionized construction workers worked on the pile. Thousands of unionized utility, utility workers, electricians, and communications workers repaired the electrical uh, and communication infrastructure of Lower Manhattan. Members of the sanitation department trucked contam contaminants to landfills. City tow truck operators removed contaminated vehicles. And finally, it was the immigrant workers, so, some unionized, but mostly uh, unorganized and undocumented who cleaned the offices and apartments of Lower Manhattan. It seems to me that if we have learned anything from those tragic days, it was the need to invest in a strong public health infrastructure and trained and effective emergency response personnel and greater acceptance of those who do the most dangerous and uh, labor-intensive work in our society. Yet. Yet the country is moving in the opposite direction. Tens of thousands of unionized public sector workers have been laid off in the last several years, and, the, uh, and health departments across the country have seen vital programs eliminated, most recently the elimination of funding for programs to prevent childhood lead paint poisoning. And attacks on immigrant workers have escalated. Yes, we have invested considerable sums of money in developing such a uh, much better incident command structure. Uh, we have invested huge amounts in stronger anti-terrorism programs, and our friends at the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences have done tremendous work in developing training programs for emergency responders, but relatively nothing has been done to develop safety and health training programs for the non-traditional emergency response workers and large numbers of volunteers who participated in the restoration of services after 9-11. Second, the experience of the World Trade Center also provides a strong argument for national health care. The illnesses which destroyed the lives and livelihoods of workers and community residents were compounded by the financial burden experienced seamlessly receiving medical treatment Rescue, recovery, and cleanup workers, area workers, community residents, students, and volunteers have been thrust into a health care system that is designed to deny people's uh, needed medical treatment. For 10 years, many of those who did not have health insurance did not have access to appropriate medical treatment. Construction workers with pic pictures of themselves working on the pile who had been forced to stop working because of their symptoms and had consequently lost their medical insurance were denied medical treatment. Workers in the area of the World Trade Center who returned to work in buildings in Lower Manhattan were similarly denied. Most immigrant workers had no health insurance and consequently little access to health care. Those filing workers' compensation met the same response as other workers with occupational diseases. They were denied. And until the city was embarrassed into funding programs at Bellevue Hospital, there was no place for residents to receive treatment unless they had private insurance. The consequences is that all too often, people lost their houses. Children were forced to drop out of school so they could go to work and support their families. And as in workers' compensation systems across the country, costs were shifted uh, from those with responsibility to the victims themselves. None of this would be an issue if we had national health care. What dominated the debate over health care was the question of liability. Who should pay? The feds, the state, the city, and in what proportion? And in this fight, the medical treatment of workers who volunteered or who worked to clean up the site were area residents or, uh, or or volunteers were delayed and denied. The passage at the end of last year of the Zadroga bill, the, the Zadroga 9-11 Health Care and Compensation Act, which will provide funding for medical treatment and wage replacement for the next five years, which was enacted into law only after World Trade Center workers, their unions, and residents waged a long fight, has produced some relief. But even that fight is far from over and the health care needs of large numbers of individuals are still unmet. A national health care system would obviate these problems and provide people injured 
pride people, injured workers and residents from suffering from environmental hazards with immediate and appropriate treatment. But a national health care system is not enough. Uh, it would solve the problem of access, but it's not sufficient. Many of those who developed sy symptoms and had insurance went to see their own private physicians. As with occupational environmental diseases generally, many of the doctors who provided treatment had no expertise nor competence to diagnose pr or provide treatment. And of course, the data of those who saw their private physicians was lost, undercut, undercutting our ability to understand the extent and the characteristics of the diseases being experienced by the exposed population. In one sense, we were fortunate that the attack was in New York State, which has the nation's only network of state-funded occupational environmental health clinics. This meant from the outset we had a set of trained physicians who were uniquely prepared to set up programs to screen and monitor workers who were exposed to a wide, uh, wide range of toxic contaminants. Yet from day one, the clinics competently led, I should mention, by Dr. Robin Herbert and doc the late Dr. Stephen Levin, were o overwhelmed and without sufficient resources to provide adequate care. We need to replicate and expand what we have in New York, a nationwide state-supported network of occupational health clinics or centers of excellence to be able to provide appropriate medical treatment in the face of such events. Third, while OSHA, under very trying circumstances, did an excellent job in protecting workers' safety, they failed miserably in protecting workers' health. We believe that the response of the agencies should have been guided by the precautionary principle rather than specific standards. That workers were going to be sick as a result of exposure to contaminants was evident from the first day, yet OSHA and EPA took a narrow approach to protecting workers. We didn't need the attack on the World Trade Center to tell us that OSHA regulations were out of date, insufficient, or lacking to protect workers' health, uh, health hazards on the job. Given that workers were exposed to thousands of substances at the World Trade Center, OSHA's policy of regulating exposures to chemicals one at a time was and continues to be absurd. Uh, as, as Dave Newman uh, of the NICOSH staff who wrote a, a really excellent article in a recent issue of uh, New Solutions magazine wrote, OSHA should assume risk and take protective measures uh, appropriate for the worst case scenarios unless, until, uh, unless and until evidence indicates that protective measures may be scaled back. Rather than enforce standards to protect workers engaged in cleanup and restoration of services after the attack, OSHA relied on voluntary, compl voluntary compliance to protect workers. The consequence was that standards such as the respiratory protection uh, standard were not enforced. And, and according to OSHA's own figures, compliance with that respiratory standard hovered around 50 percent on a good day, uh, and the workers predictably got sick. Other standards, such as OSHA's HAZWAPR standard, which would have been protective of workers' health, were not invoked or unfit, enforced. Furthermore, even if OSHA had enforced their standards, they are not designed to protect, protect workers engaged in emergency response work. OSHA standards are based on an eight-hour day five days a week. Shifts at the World Trade Center were 12 hours, seven days a week. As with workers who work overtime, no adjustment to the exposure levels were made by OSHA to account for the expanded exposure. Given who this audience is, I need not spend time discussing limitations of OSHA health standards. But what is shocking is that we have seen no OSHA, new OSHA standards promulgated which would provide more protection to workers if such an attack were to happen again tomorrow. The level of dioxin at the site was the highest ever recorded in human history, and yet we have no standard to this day to protect workers involved in uh, such work. 
Fourth, we need to have an incident command structure which is able to place the health of workers and community before the demands of politicians. Politics, not worker or resident health, dominated the response to 9-11. No one can expect that during the period immediately following an event like the attack on the World Trade Center, that rescue workers will stop to don protective clothing and respirators, though they should, as workers are trained to do when rescuing a worker in a confined space. But at the World Trade Center, the rescue phase lasted until the job was completed, nine months later. This meant that OSHA regulations were suspended for nine months. Workers' health must come first. That OSHA allowed this situation to continue is outrageous and shameful. Fifth, we must expand the definition of emergency responder and provide safety and health and emergency response training to large segments of our population. As I mentioned earlier, large numbers of workers who would not classify as emergency responders participated in the rescue, recovery, cleanup operations, and the restoration of services. Telephone installers, electricians, plumbers, sanitation workers, building maintenance staff, tow truck operators, to name a few, worked at ground zero. None were trained until months after the, uh, the attack occurred, and if then, superficially. We need to start now to provide basic introductory training to workers who are not first-line emergency responders about health hazards of toxic substances and the ways in which one can protect uh, oneself. I got 30 seconds, okay. Um, I, let me then just make the, the several points uh, cryptically here. Sixth, sixth, special programs, special protective programs must uh, we must be put in place to safeguard the health and safety of immigrant workers, regardless of their immigration status, as well as those constituencies who are not organized or represented. Uh, uh, and that goes for residents as well as for volunteers. Seventh, we must understand it was the involvement and activity of working people and residents and unions and environmental organizations working together that forced the government agencies to be accountable. From the outset, the public was lied to, told half-truths, denied information, and presented with programs which were inadequate uh, in protecting the health and safety for those who were, uh, for, 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 for which they were designed. The affected communities were not consulted, and when they were, as such as with the EPA Blue Ribbon Commission of Technical Experts, they were disbanded without explanation when the experts came to conclusions not expected by the agency. It was only the active involvement of community members, the labor movement, members of academia and health professionals, members of faith-based organizations working in a broad coalition that brought their uh, concerns to local and state uh, representatives that resulted in programs that met the needs of the community. And finally, the struggle is not over. The passage of the Zadroga Bill, a major accomplishment which provides medical treatment and compensation to some of those uh, who suffered harm will sunset in five years. We are currently engaged in a struggle to force government to provide benefits to those who have developed cancer. The workers and residents and volunteers and students who are ill um, are like the resident, like the uh, residents of Libby, Montana, and those suffering from asbestos-related uh, diseases. It is only by being organized, vocal, active, that they will receive the services and compensation, uh, let alone justice, they deserve. That is why organizations like the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization is so important, and we're honored to be working with them. Keep up the good work. I look forward to the day when ADAO is no longer needed. Fix it. Fix it. Everything in the world can be fixed.